welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker. And today we have a, a special treat for you guys. My, my old uh, friend and, and mentor, uh, Dr. Gary Habermas. Welcome to the show, Gary. Thank you, Dale. Always, always glad to talk to you. I think uh, you probably know exactly. How far do we go back with these talks? Uh, 2010. So 10 years. Only 10 years. All right. Very <laughs> good. You excellent. Um, so, so yeah, basically, I wanted to to bring you on the show to discuss your main claim to fame, so to speak, that the resurrection of Jesus. You know, we're approaching Easter season, um, sure. so yeah, I think it's uh, an excellent time to to do that discussion and uh, you know pluck your brain on that. So so just sort of getting straight into it. So I know we've got sort of a, a time limit for the one hour. So I'll turn it to you just sort of quickly. Why don't you introduce the audience? as to who you are and specifically focusing on like what's your interest in the resurrection and, and maybe plug your new projects that you're working on there. Right. <clears throat> well, <laughs> for me, it's like a, it's like a, what's your latest because all I do is resurrection. So I, I, every once in a while I publish something else, but it's almost always resurrection. So um, I got into it well decades ago literally and i have to stop and count but um it's been it's literally been decades and i got into the resurrection because many years ago at that time i started doubting my faith and it was a pretty strong doubt um i was into sports mostly football and hockey and i would um do that kind of thing in the afternoon and then when i got in at night and settled down my first question was where did I leave off the night before? And what I thought was the resurrection would do the job of evidencing Christianity if, if we knew the resurrection occurred. And that started me on, uh, uh, you know, my life of trying to show the resurrection occurred. Now, in, in the last, oh, I don't know, 15 years, it's become more of a ministry as far as people with doubts, people who want answers, people who say, I'm open, I'm a skeptic uh, like yourself, they'll say, convince me. But I, I was convinced it was the place to go. But when I first started, I wasn't convinced I had the data to do it. In fact, I, read, I reached in a place in my research where I thought I wouldn't be able to show. I, so you could believe it. But I reached a place where I thought you can't show it happened. So I was still skeptical for many years. And that's the beginning. So for me, it was doubt that later morphed into helping other people with their doubts and questions. OK, and I think you're you're sort of famous for developing what what you've what's been uh, termed the minimal facts approach. Um, mm -hmm. so, right. so yeah, maybe just briefly sort of explain well, what is the minimal facts approach? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I, I did my dissertation, my Ph.D. dissertation on the resurrection at a secular university, uh, Michigan State, way back in 1976. <clears throat> Prior to that actually being finished, I was going through my pretty serious doubts. And whenever I went up against a critic in those days, it was, uh, oh, probably my chief person was Rudolf Boltmann. And uh, he would still today be more critical, I think, than Bart Ehrman, say, who's better known. But back then, Rudolf Boltmann was just really well known. And I was trying to teeth myself against his objections. Again, not because I was trying to answer somebody, but because I was trying to see could they be answered. And I, I remember the night. I remember where I was sitting in the early 1970s, 1973, and I was dinkering around with a pad of with some paper, and I wrote on the top of it, if all I used were Boltmann's skeptical passages, if all I used were the things we could be sure of, do I have enough to say that he's wrong and the resurrection happened? And I guess you could say the rest is history, because in a sentence, the minimal facts argument is, if you take only the data conceded by skeptical scholars. They can be atheist New Testament scholars. They can be agnostic. They can be Jewish New Testament scholars. They have to be scholars. I'm not, I'm not including in my head count 
I, I mean, I include some of them, but for the most part, I don't include in my head count the people who call themselves scholars, who even Bart Ehrman goes off on and says, sorry, you're not a scholar. You don't have you don't have degrees. You haven't you don't have a teaching position. You don't have publications. Don't call yourself a scholar. There are people who don't believe Jesus exists. And, and as Bart Ehrman says, there's only a, a couple that are that are well trained, but the vast, vast majority are often angry uh, people who can't stand what Christians do and everything else, but they call themselves scholars. I'm not addressing myself to them. I'm talking to people largely with PhDs in relevant fields, which would be New Testament, theology, uh, history, philosophy, the classics, etc. And my argument is, back to my sentence, I can take the data that they concede, even if they call themselves non-Christian skeptics, I take the data they concede, and I think there's enough to show that the resurrection happened on their basis. So if the Bible is a word of God and inspired, well, yeah, that's a big if, critics would say. But if it is, resurrection happened. But what if Rudolf Boltmann is right? Bart Ehrman is right? What if they're right? And we can't know the vast majority of that material. Well, based on what they concede, we have enough to show that the resurrection happened. But I want to make it clear, these things, the arguments aren't true because the Boltmans and the Ehrmans of the world, world concede it. The arguments are true because the data say they're true, and it's because of the data that the critics think it's true. So the first thing is where are the data. Second point is everybody on board. And I can tell you that I can tell you everybody is on board. Skeptics are on board, but we have to ask why. What are the data for this? Yeah, uh, you just anticipated. I was just going to say that. So yeah, it's the two thing. It's they're strongly these facts are strongly evidenced, plus the vast majority of biblical qualified scholars accept these as, as facts. That's um, good. Yep. One, now, one follow-up here is from an atheist, uh, Matt Dillahunty. I'm sure you're aware of him. And, and he has a video about sort of critiquing the minimal facts approach. And he says, right. well, look, you're, you're guilty of cherry-picking because you're picking out certain beneficial facts, but maybe you're, you're leaving out uh, facts that could hurt the case against the resurrection. So, um, yeah, like what, what have you done to kind of guard against fallacies like cherry picking or, or that sort of thing? Dale, I would say my lead critique on that is that that's a moot point. I mean, it's it's such a bad objection that it's a moot point. And let me explain why. We are insulting the Rudolf Boltmanns, Bart Ehrmans, Gert Ludemann, Dom Crossan, uh, Borg, Marcus Borg, we are insulting them if we think they have not considered all the possible objections when they allow their facts. So if they say these six facts, they, this half dozen, these dozen facts, these 20 facts, these are true because of the evidence, and I'm going to give you some of the evidence. And if you were to say to a Crossan, an Ehrman, a Rudolf Boltmann, if you were going to say, dude, you're cherry picking, you're not counting the evidence that would count against your facts. I think he would, they would look you in the eye and say, a kind of objection is not well thought out. I'm saying they took the critical data into account and they still came up with these facts that can be known. What would you expect of a New Testament atheist? They took the objections into account and yet they think these facts are good. So if these facts are good, and they're not disproven by the data, and they're going to concede those facts, guess what? They think the facts are well evidenced. And if the facts are well evidenced, and you say to me, yeah, but don't you know Mark was written, written by a disciple? And don't you know, I don't think Matthew was written by Matthew. And don't you know, I don't think the New Testament is reliable. I'm going to say that is a moot point. It's a moot point because I'm using data that you concede for good reasons, and you do not think it's refuted by the data. So we're not cherry picking. We're doing, it's a, we're no more cherry picking that if, if in a major battle, 1,000 troops went in and 300 troops were alive at the end, 
you, you've got to say about the 300 troops that they withstood the barrage, they were in the crossfire, they lived, and therefore they successfully, or whatever, fought this battle. I'm saying they're the last people standing. And these, these minimal facts are the last facts standing. The critics have already been considered, and the refutations cannot refute them, or the critics wouldn't have conceded them. Uh, hey, I'm going around and around, but D Dale, does I, that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. I, I agree 100% with what you said. I, I think um, I agree with you that I think you know things like oh, there's contradictions in the Gospels, or right. you know facts like these are are simply not relevant to the hypothesis. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Right. It may be relevant to the hypothesis: is Christianity true or not, or something. Exactly. Or is it yeah. inspired? Yeah. I'm saying, A, I have in great detail, I have volumes. One of my volumes, Mike Laconda, The Case for the Resurrection, we have just short of 100 pages of critical theories. Secondly, I think it's even more important. We're selling the skeptic short who admit the facts in the first place because they don't believe in inspiration. They don't believe in reliability. And many times they're not Christians. We th To think they didn't entertain these, but it's their area of study. I, I think that's kind of short-sighted. Well, let me let me flip the coin here because there are actually some Christians who are critical of the the minimal facts approach. So there was a recent show a few weeks back with um, on Unbelievable with Lydia McGrew and, and Jonathan McClatchy, and they sort right. of said, "Look, I, I get where you're coming from with the minimal facts, but they're they're not enough to establish the hypothesis that the resurrection is true. For that, we need additional facts. You know, like that." based on the nature of the appearances or something. So, so what do you make of, of Christians that kind of take issue with, with that? If you're talking about that specific objection, I think it's misplaced too. And let me tell you why. Lydia McGrew, in her first book, um, I think it was her first book. Um, let me see, I've got it right here. Uh, Lydia McGrew, in her book, Undesigned Coincidences, she says at the back of the book, she's making a little critique of minimal facts, and she says, she says, I don't think minimal facts is valueless, the, the minimal fact ar argument. I don't, I'm not saying it's valueless. It does a good job at what it does, and she lists that as it kind of comes ready-made for a debate. It's ready-made for a, a data that you can use in a debate. But then she says it doesn't go far enough and we have to do more. Okay, so I, I think you know, that's where she's going. But she concedes that it does have some good value. Secondly, she says it has almost become the major way to do the reliability argument. I can tell you, I was just up at uh, about two years ago, I was up at Western Michigan University. And that's, uh, you know, the stronghold of the McGrews. And, and I haven't seen Lydia in a while, but T Tim is a really good friend. And uh, he asked, or his daughter who was there asked, uh, she's doing a PhD. And she asked in the crowd, how do you use the minimal facts argument? Uh, what do you think of it? And I said, there are many ways to do reliability. Minimal facts is one of several ways to do it. So the way, the other way I would answer that is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that undesigned coincidence is the wrong way to go. I wouldn't say that the uh, an overall reliability, you know, back to FF Roos, New Testament documents are the reliable. Craig Blomberg's done a lot of work on this. Would it be wrong to do a general umbrella approach to the New Testament? No. Would it be wrong to look at the Greco-Roman bias argument and say that the Gospels have have uh, tests like Greco-Roman biography? No. Um, are they all um, ways to do reliability? They are. What's the minimal facts? Well, you have le you have less data, but what you have, you really nail it. You really hit it on the head. And and one thing about that, Dale, you know, when I say I really you really have it, you really hit it on the head. What are we talking about? With the min the minimal facts argument majors in the gospel, the gospel message, not the four gospels, but the ma the gospel message, which at a minimum is the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Minimal facts arguments are really, really good on those points. And so if someone said to me, well, hey, you need to get the whole New Testament or nothing. Now, I don't know anybody, any Christian who's saying that, but, but you have to get the whole New Testament or nothing. I'm saying, look, I've limited my field to the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. I'll talk about a few other things. I'll talk about afterlife, because I think that's, a, that's an extension of, uh, 
of the resurrection and so on. But I only limit myself to a few things. And on those subjects, minimal facts do excellently. But it's not the only message. It's one of many. Yeah, and I, I agree 100%. I, I actually was inspired by the minimal facts approach. When I was studying the Shroud of Turin, I, I invented what I call the minimal relevant features approach to, exactly. to studying. So, wow. yeah. um, Dale, do you know, you know that a, an article was published on that, right? You, you know that um, uh, some years ago in a prestigious British journal, uh, a friend wrote to me. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? And he, he wrote and he said, hey, I want to use the minimal facts idea, but I'm going to apply it to the Shroud. And he published an article on the minimal facts of the, of the Shroud of Turin. And, and it was published in a major journal. But what's more than the article itself and even what you were doing, I think those are good approaches. But he went ahead. He's the same guy who just exploded. It's a little off the subject here, but he's the one that just exploded. He and his team exploded the carbon-14 argument against the Shroud of Turin. It was recently published by the same Oxford Journal. If I got this right, the editor of the Oxford Journal that published the explosion against carbon-14, that the guy who was the editor of that journal is the same name, one of the names on the original 88 carbon-14 anti-shroud argument he published the new argument so yeah those are minimal facts arguments and they can be applied to the shroud and they can be applied to the deity of christ and they can be applied to an afterlife and our best arguments can all be done in a minimal facts way and i'll say it again it's not the only reliability out there my my uh, teaching this my, my research assistant just finishing his phd he has a, a a powerpoint where he does 12 different kinds of reliability arguments minimal facts is one of more than a dozen ways to skin the cat, you might say, but but uh, I think for what it does, when it cuts it down itself down to a few key ideas like deity, death, resurrection, it is a major way to get there. Excellent. But you're right. Yeah. Your minimal fact shroud, Dale, is is uh, really worth considering here. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, and getting into that, it kind of speaks into our next section when we're looking at the resurrection because. One of the, the major issues uh, when we're looking at is, is the resurrection hypothesis true or probably true is the issue of prior probability or the plausibility of a right. supernatural resurrection. So, yeah, there, there are arguments on, on both sides. So I know you ha you've done um, lectures uh, filling naturalism's void where you talk about things like near-death experiences or double-blind prayer experiments. And, and on the other end, skeptics have their arguments to say it's implausible, like saying, well, billions of people have died and they don't rise from the dead. So what's, what are the odds that Jesus would rise from the dead? So yeah, I just wanted to turn it to you. What, what do you make of this prior probability factor? Can, can we determine if a, a supernatural resurrection of Jesus is plausible or, or is it implausible? Yeah, great question. You know, just before this interview started, a fellow wrote to me, and he said, I'm doing an argument on nailing down plausibility and what are the best, uh, some of the best logical arguments that put this into a logical structure. And among some other things I recommended, I recommended Richard Swinburne's book on the resurrection where he puts it with pre and post uh, probabilities in a Bayes theorem uh, situation uh, in his resurrection book. And I also referred, you mentioned Lydia McGrew, I mentioned very positively the article by Tim and Lydia McGrew on the probability of miracles and resurrection, in the particular that was published in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, uh, edited by Bill Craig and J.P. Moreland. So those are two great essays that the, the, the Lydia and uh, Tim McGrew article and the book, the little book by Swinburne, they do great. Uh, work on pre and post probability. I think in a, in a nutshell, uh, yeah, m most people are, don't rise from the dead, duh. But the point of pre and post probability is that in the case of Jesus, uh, I've done articles arguing that there are up to eight very unique things on the life of Jesus that sets him apart, not just from everybody in the world, sets him apart from every major religious founder. And I could give a list of them if you're interested, but but uh, Jesus is the only one who won two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what that does in the argument is you start narrowing the field to if this guy did a bunch of things that Buddha never did, that Krishna never did, 
that Moses never did, that Muhammad never did, that Zoroaster never did, you start saying, wow, this guy's very special. And the more special he is in these traditional Bayes theorem and other type computation categories, you cut it down. And if the evidence says that that person was raised from the dead, you have to take that very seriously because he's already shown that he is, is um, you know, far and above the rest in similar categories. Like, for example, uh, critics, Ed Yamauchi, now he's, he's not a critic, but he is a retired history professor and a very accomplished one at uh, University of Miami of Ohio. And he said that Jesus was the only founder of a major world religion of whom miracles are reported within a generation. Well, I've read critical scholars, critics, agnostics, and so on, who say that today, the entire critical field, and I think that's even a little overboard, I think that's a little positive, but these are the critics themselves saying it, that the whole critical field allows that Jesus did healings and exorcisms without answering the question about are there demons or whatever. What, they, what they're saying is those stories in the Gospels about, about uh, healings and con confrontation, confrontations with what, what people thought were demons, that those things happened just like the Gospels say so. Now, if this guy's already on a map doing some kind of miracles or something like that, if he's in that category, what's resurrection look like? Here's one more. If near-death experiences say there's an afterlife, and if we already allow an afterlife of some sort because the data for NDEs is extremely powerful, well, then into a world where there's life after death, maybe some of these people that you say, oh, zillions and zillions of people have never been raised from the dead, but maybe they've been raised from the dead in another world. Maybe they're, they're living on, and that's the NDE argument. Um, at least they live for a while. If those things are true, i.e. Jesus is exceptionally unique, B, there's an afterlife. You know, I think the tables have just been tipped. Uh, I would also say that the induction on the millions and millions argument is incorrect. The, in, the form of the inductive argument is not done correctly. And uh, not according to, to theory, not according to inductive theory. And so you put all those together, and I think personally, I think the resurrection stands the test, and I think it meets all these objections. Excellent. And uh, just a couple follow-up questions on what you said then. So uh, you mentioned NDEs, and I know this is sort of a secondary interest of yours. Um, sure. and you've told me personally that you, you've come across some, some interesting veridical cases. Did, did you want to maybe mention two, two or three examples of, of sure. these? Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I was involved in a debate a few years ago with the companion book to the one I just mentioned. I talked about the two McGrews, Liddy, Tim and Lydia Grew, doing the article on Miracle for the uh, Blackwell Companion for Natural uh, Theology. And um, uh, just check, that is the title. It's Natural Theology, not Natural Philosophy. But uh, a, a companion book is the companion, uh, the Blackwell companion to mind body dualism. And I had a debate with a fellow, a medical doctor with uh, three doctor's degrees, who argues that near death experiences are not well evidenced. And what I did in the article was I collected over 300 evidential accounts. And some of them are very, very powerful. Now, I will tell you, some of the best cases come from a book called The Self Does Not Die. And it is a collection by some scientifically trained people. It's been out for a while. And they have one uh, criterion for the over, over 100 evidence cases in that book alone. And the criterion is this. If you say you've had an NDE, then you have to report data. And it's this worldly data. It's, you know while I was in a room with no with no windows and I was having a cardiac arrest and they can they can verify that I had no present, uh, according to the machines, no present heart or brain activity. I looked outside the doctor's office. I looked outside the hospital and I saw a car accident. I'm just making this one up. And I, I saw a car accident and that silly driver, the red car went right through the stoplight, looked like he was looking at his uh, phone and he plowed right into the green car that had the right of way. And, and you can go check that out in a police report. Lo and behold, let's say the police report sh shows clearly that the accident happened after the guy's cardiac arrest occurred. Now, there's I, I just made that up. But in this book, there's over 100 evidential cases. There's a man who 
who, um, while having a near-death experience, kind of gets to look through the wall over to the next surgical chamber, and he watches a man have his leg amputated, and not just that his leg was amputated, we can imagine what that looks like, but that the persons who were doing the amputation, I think they took the leg and put it into an, a, a yellow bag, like a, like a garbage, plastic bag, like a garbage bag sort of thing. And he even told what kind of bag it was in. There's no way he would have known about you know, the leg plus what, it was, what was done. That's one. Another case in the book, a woman's up above her body and she's looking down in the NDE. And she's looking down on the top of one of the medical machines there. It's above everybody's head. And she later came to and she said, hey, I'm, I'm obsessive. I have a, a OCD. And I saw a 12-digit number riveted or whatever up on top of that uh, medical device. And here's the number, 1674 or whatever it was. She wow. gave the 12 numbers. And there were two nurses present who, and one of them in particular, copied the number down. And a while later, they were moving that machine. And the nurse said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me check that number. And the 12 digits were correct. Now, you couldn't see those digits from the ground. And 12 in a row, one after the other, would be the odds would be astronomical. And she got the odds right. Now, I can go on and on, but those are two short stories that allow you to tell this kind of evidence quickly. But the person who, about whom many of these happened had had cardiac arrest with ventricular fibrillation, meaning that they were, according to the machines now, they were heart dead. And in 15 seconds after your heart dead, according to the experiments, your brain dead. So if this thing, if your evidence happened 30 seconds after one of those states, 45 seconds, your brain and heart aren't operating. Now they can bring you back from it. But how could you report that data when your heart's not, your heart and brain are not working according to the machine? So yeah, that's some of them. And I think, Dale, it, it's important because if there's an afterlife, we've got to be open to afterlife views. And that already gives the resurrection theorist a head start. All right. Um, well, I, I did have a, a couple more questions about NDEs, but given time constraints, I'll, I'll skip over that. And maybe you'll come back on and we'll, we'll discuss NDEs fully in a, in a show or something. But one All last. Right. Yeah, that'd be, good. that'd be good, Dale. I'd be glad to do that. Awesome. All right. Uh, so, so my last follow up on this um, plausibility issue, and you sort of hinted at uh, Jesus being unique. Um, but as you know, there, there are uh, some some skeptics out there that'll say, no, Jesus isn't, isn't unique. There are many dying and rising pagan gods. Um, did you want to just sort of what's what's the counter to that? Is that true? Yeah, the problem with your sentence and your question, and I know you know this, but the, the problem with your question is you say there's many scholars out there who say this. Well, actually, there are very, if you mean specialist scholars, PhDs, uh, New Testament, history, theology, philosophy, classics, there are almost no scholars who say this, almost none. Bart Ehrman, atheist New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman says, well, in his book, Did Jesus Exist? He spends about 20 pages going off on those views. And and in a sentence, he says, there are people who left the country, they disappeared, and they come back later, or even weirder kinds of, of disappearance, but they were alive and they disappeared and they came back. There are people who are alive but never died. There are maybe people who almost died and got better. This is Bart Ehrman. But there is nobody in the ancient world. Uh, there's no pre-Christian cases, because that's the context. He's doing these pre-Christian cases. There are no pre-Christian cases where a person actually died and actually came back. He said that's, that's, not, that's not the case. And uh, so there's a lot of issues here. There's a huge debate about whether there are any of those cases. And the debate about it is very technical. And the guys who do it, I mean, one of them wrote like a 700-page book on this subject. And it's a very technical book. It's published in a German research press and... Very technical. So this is just not a, oh, yeah, I know there's cases. I read this one in a book. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting into the documents. I remember seeing one of the documents that is dated 1000 BC, that they're date, that they are, I don't mean seeing the actual document, but I mean seeing the text of it. And so it's a very technical. And the majority view is that there are no such cases. But even if there were, that's just the beginning of the problem. Because we're t you're largely talking about mythology, people who never lived. And someone could say, well, yeah, that's Jesus. Well, then once again, we're not talking about 
the Jesus never lived guys there. According to Bart Ehrman, there's only two in the group of, of sufficient degrees to call them a specialist, Bart Ehrman. And he says, neither one of them have a university seminary or accredited college teaching position. So they're, they're researchers on their own. They're, they're accredited people, but they're, they're, they don't go in the you know, classroom because, uh, and he implies, or he actually says, the reason they're not in the classroom is because that, that view is not held by anybody. So number one, most scholars say there aren't those cases, but even more, there are, I, Dale, I'll let you ask a follow-up question if you want, because I know I don't want to go, go on and on, but there are a bunch of reasons why, even if you, for the sake of the argument, and here's how the minimal facts argument works. If your facts are right, can we get a resurrection? Even if there were pre-Christian cases of these tales, how do you how do you keep it a mile away from the resurrection? And that is not hard. There's probably close to 10 good scholarly reasons why scholars don't make that move. You know, you have to ask the question, if people are atheists, if they're agnostics, if they don't believe a resurrection, if they're not even, they're, they're Jewish New Testament scholars, of which there are many, um, if that's what they are, why wouldn't they embrace this theory if it were true? And therefore, if they don't embrace it, what's the problem? So that's some of the issues. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and as you know, I, I fully agree with what you said. I, I've done shows on mythicism. So I'm, I'm on board with um, Gary's take on that my, myself. So yeah, I think that covers uh, sort of a, a broad strokes on the prior probability issue or the, the plausibility issue. So why don't we go on to the, the actual evidence itself? And there are two uh, things, right? So there's the facts themselves, and then there's how we explain those facts. And what I want to do is start with well, what what are the minimal facts themselves? What what are some of these minimal facts, and and how do we know that they're facts? Yeah, that's good. We can use one sentence that says I can use the facts that critics admit. There's enough of a basis to show the resurrection is is uh, occurred. By the way, back to the critique earlier of taking pot shots and only using good facts and ignoring bad ones. What you're exactly doing right now is going after the bad ones to see if there's anything out there. So I, you know, I commend you on that. But uh, the six facts, I, I use different numbers, Dale, and you go, why, why do you vary from three to eight, probably, in, in my decades of work? Because I do it per audience. You go, why, why do the numbers change? That sounds like a contradiction. Now, that's a misuse of the word contradiction. Uh, contradiction says two things cannot both be and not be same time, same place, same manner. And these aren't the same time, same place, same manner. I use more or less facts depending on how skeptical my audience is. But I'll tell you what, um, uh, many, many of the skeptics, I have one in mind right now, he's a Jesus seminar fella. He's a super skeptic, does not believe in the resurrection. And he admits over 20 facts. I only use six as a rule. And here's the six. Jesus died by crucifixion. Almost no scholar today questions that. And you say, well, somebody might say, well, there's a lot. There's a whole Muslim world that does it. Right. But the Muslim world of Muslim scholars are not trained in New Testament or, you know, fields that make this relevant. And they're using a document, by the way, that was written almost exactly 600 years after that happened. I have a Muslim source on my shelf right here, right next to me. Um, that says, by a Muslim, by a very well-known Muslim who disbelieves the resurrection. In fact, he refers knowingly, he refers to the word crucifixion as C-R-U-C-I-F-I-C-T-I-O-N. So he's, he's not close to the Christian view. And yet he says, he says, Christians are going to say that your book is 600 years old and it doesn't, it doesn't qualify as history. And the Muslim scholar surprisingly says, that's exactly right. It's not good as history, but I still disagree, you know, like that. But he says it's a good objection. 600 years is too long. So crucifixion, Jesus was crucified. Secondly, this is the most important one. I'm watching my words. The disciples had experiences that they believe, real experiences, that they believe were appearances of the risen Jesus. Bar Ehrman says he would never disagree with that because it's established hard and fast by history. Okay, third. It was proclaimed, the event of the resurrection was proclaimed, not with the Gospels 40 to 65 years later. Uh, I mean, not just with them. It, it's, you know, you can find it there. But, but it's proclaimed in the 
uh, the epistles of Paul, now we've moved back to 50 AD, is usually where 1 Thessalonians is placed, and virtually all critical scholars, except seven of the 13 books that bear Paul's name. The first one, 1 Thessalonians, 50 AD. Now we're back to 20 years after the cross instead of the 45 to 65, 40 years after the cross. But critics freely, the vast majority of critics freely admit that there are there are statements of the death and resurrection of Jesus that date. This is astounding that date the same year as the crucifixion or within one to two, three years maximum after that event. And when we consider that the earliest biography of Alexander that we still have is almost 300 years after he lived, that means if Alexander were, were George Washington, he, the book wouldn't even have been written yet. Um, but we can go back to death and resurrection of Jesus and deity the same year or one, two, or at the most three years later. And, and you know who admits that? Bart Ehrman, Gert Ludemann, the atheist German New Testament scholar, on and on. Rudolf Boltmann admitted that it's very, very early. He said early is church. So very early, fourth, their lives were transformed, turned upside down by these facts. Now, I'm not going to argue that they all died as martyrs, but disciples, but I'm arguing that they were willing to die as martyrs. And you say, well, how do you know? You can't read their minds. I'm not reading their minds. I'm reading their actions. If you're afraid to die, you don't go dozens and dozens and dozens of times throughout your decades of ministry into places where it's likely that, or at least very, very possible, that there's going to be an attempt to kill you. Paul gives several lists of how many times he was beaten, 40, 40 stripes minus one. Um, he was shipwrecked. Of course, that was nobody doing it to him, but he was shipwrecked. Point is, he kept going where he could be shipwrecked. Happened three times, I think. Uh, he was stoned and left for dead. His disciples took him to bury his body and found out he was alive. These people put themselves in places where they could easily have been killed. In fact, we can show that several of them were. The big four, Peter, Paul, James, the brother of Jesus, and John, we have first century uh, recordings of three of their four martyrdoms. So they were willing to die for this message. Four and five, two skeptics, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, the persecutor, alias or Saul, uh, alias Paul, um, the, the, they both became believers because they thought they saw the risen Jesus. So those are the six I would use. Jesus died. Typos had experiences. They were reported exceptionally early. They transformed their lives and eventually a lot of other people's. And then two critics, James and Paul, became believers because they were sure they saw the risen Jesus. So just to so these would not uh, something like the empty tomb that that wouldn't qualify as a minimal fact in your view is that correct? It, it qualifies as a minimal fact on the first criterion alone. There is almost none of the minimal facts that have as many evidences. If you just want data, and I I tend that way, but I want something where the critics are going to agree with me. I, I mean, like virtually all of them. Here's the status on the empty tomb. There's over twenty critical arguments. I don't mean quoting a verse and saying, there you go. I mean arguments the way Boltmann, Ehrman, Ludemann give the arguments. There are over 20 critical arguments for the empty tomb. That is solid. That's more than most of the minimal facts. However, because the empty tomb took a long time to get accepted, when I went to graduate school, I'm just guessing, it might have been 20% of critical scholars. Today, that number is up to about 75% believe the empty tomb. All right, it's not the 98% or 99% that are going to concede that the disciples had experiences that they thought were appearance of the risen Jesus. But 75 is great, especially if you realize that the disciples having experiences have been accepted by critical scholars for over 200 years. Empty tomb was largely rejected during the the age of Rudolf Boltmann back in the up and through the 70s. So it's kind of coming along slowly. But it has 75%. So on data, yeah, it qualifies. On almost unanimous acceptance, no. Gotcha. All right. What what about uh, the nature of the resurrection? You know, so some some uh, skeptics will say, uh, like Dale Martin, for example, he argued in a debate that it was a spiritual body. Jesus Jesus rose spiritually, or in this uh, penuma body. It, it's not a physical resurrection body. Um, would you right. say that is that a minimal fact, the physical bodily resurrection? Well, 
what kind of body, um, by the way, by the way, back to Lydia McGrew, and she's a friend. But when Lydia, you made a point that I think I didn't respond to, but this is one of hers. She said, you can't get the whole resurrection message from minimal facts. My response is, A, I'm only trying to get the fact. I'm not trying to get the whole picture from the minimal facts. But B, she specifies we can't get a bodily resurrection from the minimal facts. That's just false. It's just false. Now, let's let's mention Dale uh, uh, Martin as an example. He says, your question is, those who say it a, was a pneuma, a spirit, and not a soma, which is the Greek for body. Well, let's just look at one text. I mean, there's many in the New Testament, but in Philippians 3, one of the accredited books of Paul, Philippians 3, Jesus and, uh, uh, sorry, Paul ends the chapter by saying, Jesus is going to come. He's going to change our vile soma body to be like unto his glorious soma. He could have said, Jesus is going to change our body to be like his spirit, but he doesn't. Paul says Jesus is going to change our body to be like his glorious body. In 1 John 3, we read, uh, we're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be like him. So we're going to have bodies. And I, I can go, Paul is the one that critics often uh, cite when they want to make this point. Consider the following. Paul's sociology required bodily resurrection because he believed, you know, when he speaks of resurrection of the dead, he always speaks in the plural. The dead will be raised together. How can the dead be raised corporately? And he says, Romans 8, they will inherit a new earth. Well, that's interesting. I'm sorry. I'll take my current body in this current sinful world over a pneuma spirit trying to make sense of a corporate new, new earth. The fact that Paul says we're going to be raised corporately and in a new earth would imply we have to, if, we're going to, if I'm going to be in a new Garden of Eden, which is what the book of Revelation calls heaven, by the way, it's uh, paradise, Pier, paradiso uh, is the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. Um, why does Paul say it's going to be a soma body? And secondly, it's going to inherit a new earth. Spirits don't care a big deal for a refurbished earth. And uh, those are two arguments. The corporate resurrection, like I said, is plural. Paul says in his writings, I gave you an example from Philippians 3, 1 Corinthians 15 is another one. Paul talks about bodies being raised. Here's another one. Paul was a Pharisee. He identified himself as a Pharisee. The Pharisees were known for their view of bodily resurrection. So there's just a few. Um, the guys who spend the most time with bodily resurrection are, um, I'll give you three names, Tom Wright. His big book on resurrection, over 700 pages, 500 of those pages are a word study on the words agnosticus and egero, the words for resurrection and raised. And he shows that there's not an, ex he argues that there's not an exception in the ancient world, that even Greeks and Romans who didn't believe in bodily resurrection, when they used the word resurrection, they meant bodily. They just didn't believe that. But when they used the word resurrection, they meant bodily. The Michael Kona, Resurrection of Jesus, starting at page 400, has an excellent treatment of the bodily nature of the resurrection appearances. And the third one is Bob Gundry's book on Soma. It's a book on Pauline anthropology, and he's got a section called Soma, Body, in Death and Resurrection. And he gives, an, I think, an irrefutable argument that says that in the New Testament, body that dies and is raised is a real body, not like a mere spirit. Yeah, yeah. And just to, to add to that, um, a number of years ago, you, you sent me a, an excellent article, which I'll, I'll put in the sources for my audience, by James Ware on 1 Corinthians 15. And, yep. and yep. he gave a pretty conclusive argument that it's definitely a bodily, bodily yeah. resurrection in mind. So. Yeah, and I will, I will add there, Dale, that that, that article by, by Ware, he's one of several scholars. Another one is Richard Baucom. Another one is uh, Bart Ehrman. Um, another one's Garrett Ludeman, these skeptics. Uh, they are now talking about a consensus view. And Ware says very carefully that there are virtually no, dis there's virtually no disagreement that, and so does Richard Baucom, virtually no disagreement that the resurrection was proclaimed from the very beginning and that it was bodily. You know, Dale Allison believes the appearances were, that the New Testament says, the appearances were bodily. Bart Ehrman 
doesn't believe in resurrection. And yet he says that Paul meant bodily by it. And I just uncovered an article. I've got it right here. An article written by um, uh, Reginald Fuller, a, a major, he's deceased, but a major uh, resurrection authority and, and a critic. And he wrote back in, let me grab it, 1979. And he does a what can we know by by uh, consent of all critical scholars way back in 79. And he d puts out there what we can tell from the data. And he lists the same thing. So what I'm saying is, while we can bring a bunch of people up from the present, a major scholar like Reginald uh, Fuller was saying this back in 1979 that this was the consensus. So these views have been around for, uh, what's that make it, over 40 years, critics agree to this data. All right. Um, so my last follow-up then on, on these facts here are, okay, so you, you said it's a minimal fact that the disciples had uh, experiences um, where what uh, they believed were the risen Jesus. Right. Now, so this minimal fact doesn't split up like individual. It doesn't say, oh, the women had an appearance. It doesn't say the the 12 had a group appearance at the same time. Uh, like, or sorry, I should ask you, like, what what's included in this? Do we get specific appearance accounts? Can like, what can we grasp from this in terms of specific appearances? Back to where Bauckham, by the way, I didn't put Jimmy Dunn in there who's as influential as any critical scholar today, Jimmy Dunn says that that early creed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we haven't talked about it yet, but the early creed in 1 Corinthians 15, which I'll mention right now, uh, Paul says he's got a source that predates him. It's not his. He got it from somebody else. Bart Ehrman says it was probably in existence with Paul's other creeds before he was even converted on the way to Damascus. That's how early it is. Um, Paul says, I'm giving you other material. And that the view you were just mentioning, uh, scholars put it there, and and Jimmy Dunn says it was that creed was probably originated the same year Jesus was crucified, the same year he was crucified. And Alexander's what again? Yeah, first biography plus three hundred years. I mean, this stuff is too hard to you know. And someone says, well, yeah, okay, so it's real, real early. I didn't know that. It's only a year. Okay, cool. But it's not accredited. It's a religious myth. Great. You know, you know where these guys say Paul got it? Way back in 1979, that article by Fuller. He agrees with the guys writing today. Where? Dunn. Um, and these, these other guys. Ehrman says it's very possible that when Paul went to Jerusalem at plus five, just five years after the cross, he interviewed James and Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, a skeptic, previous skeptic, before he met the risen Jesus, and uh, Peter. And they talked about the facts of the gospel. The facts are at least the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. Paul uh, Paul goes back later, still before the first New Testament book, in Galatians 2, and he talks to, about the facts again, and John is there. So when, these, when people say, I'm trying to preempt another major critique, yeah, 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 so it's a creed and it's really, really early, but that's all it is. It's religious propaganda, really? Well, Paul got it, or at least the facts of the creed, he got it from the guys who are making the reports. You go, well, I don't believe those guys wrote the Gospels. I'm not talking about the Gospels. I'm talking about Paul going to Jerusalem and interviewing Peter and James, and then there's Paul himself. And then in the next chapter, same three, plus John is there. He interviewed the eyewitnesses. So Bart Ehrman, of all people, I quote him a lot, but he's, a, he's an honest critic who, you know, makes these comments and remains an atheist, you don't have to you know, marry the girl you take to the dance or vice versa, the guy you take to the dance. You don't have to marry him, but you know there's a dance and you know you could have gone. You know the facts. And Bart Ehrman says these things were in existence before Paul was converted. So, and, and by the way, on the eyewitnesses, Bart Ehrman says, he asked this question, did Jesus exist? He says, where do we get closer to eyewitness testimony anywhere in the New Testament than right here? Okay, right where? Galatians 1, where Paul goes and interviews Peter and James. So these aren't just little myths that people told, little stories from the beginning. They're from the eyewitnesses. Yeah, well, the eyewitnesses were lying. Okay, well, you tell me why they keep walking into the lion's den and be willing to die. And they spent their whole life not fishing and making a lot of money, but getting beat up 
and proclaiming the gospel. So right. those right. are ways to check and they, those are ways to go back and forth and check these data. Well, let me ask this as a quick follow-up then, because you, you mentioned the First Corinthians Creed. Um, right. And, you know, the majority of scholars, is, oh, it's early and that sort of thing. But there, there are people like Bob Price who say, no, no, this is, a, this is an interpolation. But, you know, Dale, when you started talking, I realized I hadn't answered your whole question. Let me go back just a little bit. Still talk about the same thing, First Corinthians sure. 15, 3 and following. Uh, you say, where did we get these uh, groups? Um, in that early creed, dating from if done is right the same year, if Ludeman and others, atheists are correct, uh, one to three years afterwards, um, Bart Ehrman says we have a bunch of these reports of the death and resurrection that are only one to two years after. So uh, where do we get the groups? The groups come from that list in 1 Corinthians 15, where three of the five listed appearances are groups. One to a group called the Twelve, one to a group called all the Apostles, which is bigger than the Twelve, and one to a group called 500 Brethren. Now, if you interpret that, if the word brethren there means guys, you know, if that's like the word we way that we use a generic guys today, if it's men only, if, if it's people, it's 500. But if he means men, he appeared to the brethren. There could have been a thousand or fifteen hundred people there. This is this is uh, presumably outdoors somewhere. Like Jesus fed the five thousand, he and he fed the four thousand. You, you can have those many people easily. So we have big groups. Then you you mentioned the women. Where do the women come from? Well, the Jesus Seminar, who reject ninety percent of the red letter words of Jesus, the Jesus Seminar, when they say, uh, by the way, they say that that First Corinthians fit. These guys that reject ninety percent haven't mentioned them too much. Um, they have a line where they voted that that early creed is pre-Paul's conversion, pre-Paul's conversion, the Jesus Seminar does. And then they add in a note at the bottom. They said you've got uh, three individuals, Peter, um, James, and then Paul adds his appearance. That's three. And then you've got the three groups, the 12, all the apostles, 500. The guys say, let's in the notes, they go, it's not in this creed that they comment. But don't forget the women. Don't forget the women. So that would be another group appearance, at least according to Matthew uh, 28. Jesus appears to the women as they're leaving the tomb. So that's another one. And the other place you get these early creeds is in these what are called, I, I can't uh, describe them right now. I'll be glad to do it sometime. But the Acts sermon summaries, they generally occur in Acts 1 through 5, 10 and 13. Bart Ehrman dates many of them, if not all of them to one to two years after the cross, and you get group appearances in those. So we have data uh, beyond Paul and groups like the Jesus Seminar and other skeptics who accept these group these group experiences, whatever they were. Now, okay, you asked me about Bob Price and interpolation. Bob says, I don't think those verses were in the in the original. And, and Bar, Bob's a good guy. I mean, I mean, I like him. He does good research. He's, and as I told you earlier, he's a friend. But Bart Ehrman goes after that view in his book. In his book, uh, one one arch critic against another arch critic, and Bart Ehrman says, "You know what?" He says, "You can't do away with that." He says, "It was there in the original. It's there in every single manuscript, and it's there in the earliest manuscripts." He says, "You can't whisk things under the carpet by not liking them." And you know, he gives it a name, uh, Dale. Uh, uh, Bart Ehrman calls Bob Price's tactics the hermeneutics of convenience. In other words, I don't like these verses. I don't think they're there. At least that's what that's what Ehrman says about them. So I can just say, to repeat Ehrman's arguments, they're in every single manuscript. No reason to leave them out. And some of those manuscripts are in a bulk of manuscripts, of papyri manuscripts that are the earliest manuscripts we have. Yeah, and that's uh, I, I agree with you as well. When I read um, read that, it, it was it just seemed very convoluted. Like there's in, it's not even just one interpolation. It, there's interpolations on top of interpolations. That's right. Every time the subject comes up, it magically gets interpolated with no. Bob and I dialogued years ago. And again, I like Bob, and and he said the same about me. That's con that's kind. We're friends. But but when we were dialoguing, I was using this little this little. Um, debate tactic and bob would say but gary you think that's an interpolation 
And and I and I would say, Bob, let me just stop. If you're going to use that again, let me ask the question again. Do you have any textual data for that? He said, no. I said, OK, let this be noted. You have no textual data for what you're saying. OK, let's move on. And then later, Gary, you know, I think that's interpolation. Well, Bob, I know. But if you're going to say that and it's anything but convenience, please give me data. Do you have any textual data? Uh, no. All right, let's move on. And he said that every time. He admits there's no textual data for it. So to me, it's too easy to make that move because, you know, if it's something, especially if it's something so big, if, if you're not a Christian. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, I think the, the last section of our debate here is, okay, great. We, we've got these minimal facts. I can grant them to you. But now how do we explain these facts? Why should I believe there's a resurrection? So so maybe just to sort of start it off, can, can you give us an idea? What, what are some sure. of the various ways that we can explain these facts? Is the resurrection I, really the, the only hypothesis? I hope I'm answering your question. But the way I would say it is, let's simplify this. Let's not try to make resurrection some hocus pocus doctrine that you have to have smoke in the room and and everybody get quiet and start humming. And, you know, it's not some hocus pocus thing. It's this easy. Um, if I buried you on Friday afternoon or if you're a disciple, if you know the people who buried him on Friday afternoon, and if a couple of your people were there at the cross and they saw everything and you're buried, here's the question. If somebody's buried on Friday and they are dead, that could be covered too, but if they're buried on Friday, what happens if you see them on Sunday? Or what happens if you see them on Wednesday, the next Wednesday? What if you see them the next Friday? And and I know this is kind of a silly example, but so somebody gets my point. I tell the story. Uh, John Ankerberg on on television has had me tell the story several times. He just he loves it. But let me give you an example. You go to your best buddy's funeral. You watch the body. You stay there a little longer than everybody else, and they take the the sashes that go underneath the casket and they put it down inside the cement box. They put the top on it, and as the guys start covering it with dirt you walk away and the person's buried and you're sad it's a bad friday night it's a bad saturday but you're buying bread in the supermarket on sunday and you're pretty sure you just saw your friend and you scratch your head and you go i know him really really well he doesn't have a twin brother Besides, he's got a scar on his face from this accident he had as a teenager. And that guy, I'm pretty sure he had a scar on his cheek. Looks like him. But you don't think anything about it. You keep walking up and down the roads. You go, I better get some milk while I'm here. And I'll get some eggs, too. And you see the guy again. And the next time you see him in the supermarket, two of your buddies are there. And they're all talking to him. And so you walk over and you go, is this you? Let's say his name's Bob. Um, yeah, Bob's standing there. Bob, is this really you? Yeah, it's me. Look at the scar on my cheek. And no, I don't have a twin brother. Dude, I saw the casket put down to the ground and I was there, you know, especially if he's the pastor. He sees him latch down the casket with the body inside, watches the whole thing. He's in the hearse. He sees everything happen. How do I know it's you, Bob? And Bob says, Bob starts saying some odd things. Well, look, here's, here's my scar. I'm fine. I've been raised. And uh, let's say something crazy. God told me I could come back and see you. Now, Right away, he does not have all the supernatural signs that we were saying Jesus did earlier. Bob didn't do miracles during his life. He didn't claim to be the son of God. He isn't the only religious founder who said, what you do with me determines where you spend eternity, basically, when Jesus said, you know, take up your cross and follow me and so on. Um, and, and so one of the guys, while they're talking, let's just say one of your buddies says, oh, Bob, hey, by the way, good thing we're back by the front door again because you're tracking mud in here. And there's some mud on the floor. So even after Bob walks out, you can watch the guys clean up the mud. You go, why did you use the mud example? Because if the Shroud of Turin is the burial garment of Jesus, now that's an if. But, and I don't think it's as strong as the minimal facts, but I think the Shroud argument's strong. The man in the Shroud has blood and dirt on the bottom of his feet. You go, well, that sounds like a fairy tale. Right, except that sticky tape samples have been taken off of that dirt 
The shroud, to our knowledge, has not been out of Western Europe, yet the dirt on the bottom of the man's feet was limestone taken from the Jeru a species of limestone found almost exclusively, well, found in the, in the Jerusalem slash Dead Sea area right outside of Jerusalem, mud. So the man in the shroud could have tracked mud and blood, uh, but you see Bob in the supermarket, there's, there's uh, dirt on his feet. And he's tracking it. You're trying to get him to get out so as the guy does you don't make more work. Then then a buddy goes, Hey, before we split up, Bob, I don't believe this, but I'm starting to believe you. Uh, can I take a photograph of all of us? And you go, Yeah, a photograph. You go, All right, Habermas, why'd you bring up the photograph? Because if the Shroud of Turin is the leading theory today, is that it's two kinds of radiation from a dead body that was crucified. Two kinds of radiation. A radiation is a photograph. When you get a broken arm, you go, yeah, they wouldn't gave me, I wouldn't got a photograph and my arm is broken. Because an x-ray is a photograph, it's a type of photograph. And so that's my illustration there. Mud on the feet, a photograph, and a scar on the face. And you're starting to put two and two together. And you're going, this doesn't really fit in my world, but maybe I better make my word world bigger to make this fit. Now, Dale, that's a really, really long explanation. But I think that's, to break it right down, it's this. Was the man dead on Friday? And was he seen, supermarket, I don't care. Was he seen on the next Sunday, the next Wednesday, the next Friday, Luke says for 40 days. If that happened, that's a resurrection. All right. Um, well, I just have two because I know we got a timeline. When we breached, we're over an hour right now. Do, do you have time for just two and I, quick and I'm And I'm long-winded, aren't I? No, no, it's great. I think it's been been awesome. So, are you willing to go on? No, I, I'm I'm stating that as a fact. I am long winded. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. There you have it, folks. Straight from the horse's mouth. So, yeah. um, all right. So, so Gary, uh, one question I wanted to ask you. Um, and again, so I have my approach. Do Do you think of uh, that looking at any of the appearances in isolation, uh, or any of the minimal facts in isolation, can get us the resurrection hypothesis is true or does it only work as a cumulative thing all the facts together i think i think cumulative is the best argument however dale when you and i were talking about this years ago we spent as i recall parts of a few long conversations one to two hours parts of a few on the appearance to the 12. i think the appearance to the 12 is the best attested account. It's in that early creed in 1 Corinthians 15. It's in the Acts sermon summaries, meaning according with the uh, consensus of New Testament scholars, it falls in within a year to two years. The proclamation of it falls within one to two years after the cross, but it's also backed up, uh, group appearances. It's also backed up in, uh, it's in Luke, it's in John, I've already mentioned Acts. Now you've got a group appearance to the women in Matthew. You've got more than one group appearance. You've got three group appearances in John. I'm just doing it off the top of my head. There's three group appearances to the disciples in John. There's two appearances in Luke. And people can say, oh, yeah, well, that's mythology. <laughs> right. Well, then you find it in Bart Ehrman. You find it in Rudolf Bultmann. You look it up in, in Garrett Ludeman. You look it up. They're going to concede this stuff because the evidence, if not the one, they'll take the other one. They'll take, for sure, they'll take the one of 1 Corinthians 15. They'll take the one of the Acts sermon summaries. These are these are powerful. So, if I, Okay, so to answer your question, I prefer a cumulative case. But if I were going to go after just one, I would take the, I would take group appearances, and subdivide the group appearance of the disciples. Perfect. Yeah, uh, that that's pretty much on the same board, um, same level as what what I did. I think the it was. I think you came up with the twelve as being the strongest one. Correct me if I'm wrong. I did. Yeah. I, I think there's there's two ways, two arguments there. But but yeah, this this is um, about your opinion and that sort of thing. But um, okay. So so on the the with the group appearance of the 12 or these appearances, the last question I, I wanted to get at it in terms of mechanism. So you're sort of famous. And the reason um, I, I like you is you go beyond and you really get into psychological explanations. So I'll be linking to the, the article you did on your website with Bergion. 
um, looking at, you know, hallucinations or illusion, ex- delusion explanations. So did you maybe want to, like, that seems to be the best uh, naturalistic explanation people have. So, yeah, do you what? mind maybe? Hallucination? Like, yeah, like some kind of psychological explanation for it. So, yeah, maybe did you want to just explain why those don't work in, in the case of the, the minimal sure. Facts? Sure. You know what? Uh, let me do a couple things. Uh, number one, on my website, GaryHabermas.com, I have another. Number, I don't sell anything. So if you want to get my books, go to Amazon. I don't sell them. But on my website, I have a bunch of articles. One of them is an article, and according to the stat counters that I get, groups that count your publications, a lot of people look at this article, but it's right there. It's I think it's 19 refutations of various forms of the hallucination article. Then there's the one you are talking about, the one I wrote with the medical doctor, Joe Bergeron, in a distinguished uh, journal, the uh, Irish Theological Quarterly. And that's on hallucination. But this one, this other one, which is in the Christian Research Journal, I have 19 refutations. Let me just say an aside, it appears to me that Bart Ehrman used to take an hallucination ar- ar- uh, argument. But in his latest book on this, that just came out a few years ago, he said, I'm no longer going to take a naturalistic theory. So I think he might, you might catch him arguing hallucinations, but I think he's kind of moved away from that. And I, I wonder why. But I think the biggest problem for, there's a lot of huge problems for hallucinations, but the biggest one is the one we just covered, the groups, the group appearances. An hallucination is something you believe so strongly or you're in a psychological state where you believe you saw something, but nobody else sees it. Somebody standing right next to you does not share it. Uh, somebody right next to you cannot wake up in the morning. If they're in the same room with you, they're not going to wake up and see the same dream you saw. Um, so if you have an, a, an evidenced, and by the way, the, the, the fact that the disciples had appear experiences that they thought they saw the risen Jesus, that's one of the, that may be the only minimal fact that has more evidences than the empty tomb. I, it, it depends on how you count them because critics count them differently, but I got up to over 30 evidences for that one fact the way the critics do evidences, and that's why nobody questions it. But uh, I would say the group uh, is the best. But here's some other ones. I asked my graduate students, is hallucination an empty tomb view or a full tomb view? In other words, should the tomb have been empty or full? And they will always say, well, it's a, it's a full tomb view. When, wherever the body is, it's still there. Right. But there are over 20 evidences that the tomb was empty. That makes you come up with another theory. So empty tomb is really, really hard on hallucinations. The hardest one is the evidence for the group appearances. And I would say the 12 leads the list. But you can make, I've got a buddy who question. he makes a, a he, he's had probably a thousand emails and he largely questions the most skeptical guys in the world. And one, he's got it in writing. And when he asks them, what do you think about the 500? vis-a-vis hallucinations, the majority of them say, yeah, yeah, the appearance of the 500 is a reason I think hallucinations is a joke. So you can have other group appearances besides the one to the to the 500. So I, I, I would, the problems with hallucinations are, are many, many, but those are just uh, a few of the biggies. Uh, the groups, the group hallucinations, here's another one, hallucinations, People who have hallucinations, I've done this myself with people, uh, people who have hallucinations, they can, they're generally talked out of them fairly easily. And when you ask them, why did you say that that hallucination didn't happen later? And they often give two reasons. Um, number one, those things don't happen, whatever it is, because there were reasons they were seeing crazy things. And they were sleep, perver- these are examples of the uh, special forces who are uh, going to hell week, so to speak, and they're de- they have bodily deprivation and they don't get food and everything they need and they start hallucinating a lot of times. And they'll say, no, I, I, the hallucination wasn't true. The porpoise wasn't jumping over the, the ship because why? Number one, those things don't happen. Number two, my buddies didn't see it. Now, if one guy thought he saw the risen Jesus, wouldn't they say to him, dude, that doesn't happen. And number two, we were right there with you and we didn't see it. So people are often talked out of hallucinations, but, but that's another problem. I could give a long list, but anybody who wants to go there, Christian research article, 19 refutations of various kinds of hallucination theories.
I, I, I agreed with you, uh, much of your take. I, I sort of approached my study, I approached it with two arguments. So there was that sort of group mechanism dynamics where I don't think appealing to something like social um, social contagion or something like that, will, or so, social coordination, that, that doesn't do the trick there. And then the second thing was also they saw Jesus in a non-glorious way as opposed to a glorious way. And that, that was against their expectation and hallucinations operate consistent with that. So yeah, yeah that, was, that was how I got there. Now, so. By the way, by the way, that, that natural way is like the guy buying, buying bread in the supermarket. He, yeah. he wasn't like an angel shining. It was your buddy with the scar on his cheek with the loaf of bread under his arm, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, that, that does it. Uh, look at that. Not too, yep, an hour and 15 minutes. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming on, Gary. I hope uh, you had a good time on your end. I do. I always do, Dale. I, I really respect where you came from. And back in the day, if people have not, not known you on your show or don't know you from the background, like you said, we've been doing this for 10 years together. And I can vouch, Dale, when, when you became a Christian, what year? Uh, twenty May fifth, twenty eighteen. Okay, so we've been talking for ten years, but eight of those, you were very skeptical, and I'm telling you, folks, Dale came with, with, uh, I mean, for eight years, I'd have to say they were the best objections, only because he had eight years to develop these things, but he was very, very good at it, and he asked the most minute things, and we would normally talk for one to two hours, and we did it about every what, every month and a half, maybe, for yeah, all that yeah, time. Every month, and, or and 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 you you can, folks. He went down a great path. He uh, became a Christian in eighteen two thousand eighteen, and and I'm blessed. Sometimes people who interview me, sometimes the questions aren't always good, and it's hard to correct somebody live on the air and go, yeah, I that's not really my view. Let me tell you my view is, but you you have it right on. You know where I'm cut you know, coming from, you know, where the data are, and that's because it helped you too. And, and you got there yourself. I just want to compliment you, Dale, for great questions, great time. It's been a great hour and, and a quarter. And I am glad to help folks in any way who might, uh, you know, catch on to this. Awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Obviously, you know, that that means a lot to, to me coming from you. And you've been fundamental in, in helping me come to faith. So it's a pleasure Thanks. having you on my show. Thanks, Dale. All right. All right, everyone. Uh, so coming up next time, just for the audience, um, again, J Justin Briarly has agreed to come on the show. Um, he's going through, there, there's some health issues, so we've had to postpone things, um, but hopefully I uh, should have that up by next week for you guys. We'll, we'll see how it goes. All right. Have a great week, everybody.